Well, we're starting off a two-week series this morning. We're just a fall kickoff series. We're going to be talking about a couple of topics this year. I mean, uh, you know, summer's come to an end. We feel the fall coming in. Kids are back to school. And uh, so the next couple of weeks, I just want to challenge you from the scriptures uh, just on a couple of uh, topics that are very central to who we are just by way of reminder or even maybe something that you might learn. And so this week we're going to be looking at who is uh, or where is your treasure. And then next week we'll be looking at who is your judge. And as we look at where is your treasure this morning, basically what I want to start with is this. Think about this. Who and what you value says much about who you are as a person. Who you value reveals who you are. Who you value reveals who you serve. Who you value reveals who is the most important person to you or what is the most important thing to you. Now you might respond and say, well, I don't serve anybody. Some of you might say, no, I do serve someone. But for those who would say, well, I don't really serve anyone, you need to stop and think about that because it's not possible to serve no one according to the Bible. And who we serve defines who we are and who we value the most. So, I mean, think about this. Who is the most important person in your life, group of people? Is it your spouse? Is it your children? Is it your friends, group of friends? Or is it as you may know, is supposed to be, is it the Lord Jesus? If you serve Him and if you value Him the most, then Jesus is going to talk to us this morning on what that should look like if it's not true in your life. Or maybe by way of reminder and encouragement, if you've been maybe a little bit laxed on who you serve, you've forgotten who you serve, so this morning, he's going to teach us, and he's going to tell us, and he's going to ask us, where is your treasure? So if you have a Bible, open it to Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. You can turn on your mobile device if that's the way you do it. As always, I'll do my best to answer any questions or concerns you have about this particular message. You can text that in, and I'll be glad to address that at the end. So Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at verse 19. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19. Jesus says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, you may know this, but the context of where we find these words of Jesus are in his, what we call, Sermon on the Mount, right? That sermon he gave near the Sea of Galilee. Luke calls it the Sermon on the Plain. Matthew calls it the Sermon on the Mount because on the mount there is a plain. But this is where he gives that message. We're very familiar with it. You probably know that the main thread through the Sermon on the Mount is, I would say, and you would probably hear this and say, yeah, I think that's right. It's the issue of the heart. Jesus goes after the heart on the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that God is more concerned about why you do what you do and not just what you do. That was true in the Old Testament and it's true today. 
God doesn't just want you to obey outwardly. He wants you to obey inwardly. Right? What matters most is not just what you do, obedience. What matters most is why we do it or why we obey. Now, before this sermon begins, I was just to set this up where we're going to be going today. We read in chapter 4 that Jesus began to say this. As he began his ministry after the temptation in the wilderness, it says, He began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the way Matthew records that is that he, th- this is what he began to do and he continued to do. But it's simply, his preaching ministry was characterized by this phrase. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when he begins the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, he's basically expanding on what Jesus meant by repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, that's why Matthew places it where he does. He says, Jesus began to do this, and now let me explain with Jesus' own words what he meant, right? And to repent simply means to change. Literally means the changing of the mind. To change the direction of your life. Simply to forsake something and to follow something else. To forsake everything and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And Matthew says, Jesus' ministry was characterized by this call to repentance. Repentance particularly repentance of the heart. In other words, Jesus called for a change of heart. Now, we know that this begins, right? We know this begins when we first encounter the Lord Jesus, when He finds us and we recognize and agree with Him that we are sinners and that we deserve His judgment because of our sin against Him. But it also continues from there when we forsake our sin, confess it to Him, Cry out to Him for mercy. Save me from my sin. Save me from the judgment. Forgive me for all that I've done against you. And we know the only way to receive that gift that Jesus accomplished on the cross is through faith on the basis of grace alone, meaning we couldn't earn it. Only God could accomplish it. And now we live by the power of the Holy Spirit that He has given us. That's repentance. That's what Jesus was preaching. By the way, Chapter 4, right before the Sermon on the Mount, verse 17, or verse 23, it says that Jesus began to preach and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. So when we get into the Sermon on the Mount, he's expanding on the gospel of the kingdom. So think of these terms. The gospel of the kingdom is repentance. The gospel of the kingdom is in the Sermon on the Mount. Make sense? And he's calling for a change of heart in this message. So when we get into chapter 6, keep that in mind. Jesus is calling for a change of heart, a change on the inside, not just, not just on the outside. Jesus preached repentance. Now as we get into chapter 6, verse 19, as we have just read, Jesus is going to teach us three truths concerning our heart, three basic truths that reveal where our treasure is. And the first one he talks about is found in verse nine, beginning in verse 19, and it's what I would call the inclination of the heart. The inclination or the direction of the heart. What is our heart inclined to? Now notice in verse 19 he says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Do not store up treasure upon the earth. Now, treasure, simply something that has value. Something that we value. Something that we value enough that we're willing to stockpile it because it has worth. We're willing to protect and guard it because it's valuable to us. Because why? Because it's our treasure. It's precious to us. And he says, do not store up treasures on the earth. Now when he says that phrase, it's a command. So he isn't suggesting here, by the way. But the way he gives the command in the present tense, right? We've encountered that before. It's this idea of continuous, ongoing 
action, ongoing, repeated action. And then when you find the present tense along with do not or no, it more literally means this. Stop storing up treasures upon the earth. In other words, he's not just saying don't store up treasures on the earth. He's saying stop what you're already doing. Right? In fact, in this sermon, Jesus says that about several things. When you look at verse 16, he says, whenever you fast, stop putting on a gloomy face. In other words, to impress other people. Later on, he will say, do not be worried about your life. It's literally, stop being worried about your life. Chapter 7, which we'll get into next week, he says, don't just do not judge. He's saying, stop judging. Make sense? So here he's saying, stop treasuring the things upon the earth. In other words, don't just... He's not saying, do not do it. He's saying, stop doing it. Now, why would he say, stop doing it? What, is, what does that imply? It implies that Jesus knows and understands what these people, his original hearers, and those of us who hear from the praises of Scripture, he's saying that he knows that we have the tendency to store up treasures upon the earth. We have the tendency to value the treasures that are on the earth. He knows our hearts. He knows the inclination of our fallen sinful hearts, and he knows that our hearts are drawn to treasures upon the earth. He reveals the natural direction or what I would call the proclivity of our hearts with this command. He uncovers, peels back, and says, that's what's in your heart. And you know it. Therefore, stop treasuring things of the earth. He knows where our affections lie. He knows that's our natural, the natural draw to our hearts. Now, he's basically saying this. Stop valuing that which is temporal or temporary. Why would I say that? Because that which is on the earth isn't eternal. It isn't lasting. It doesn't endure. It's temporal or it's temporary. It's here for a time, but it can be taken away. It can be lost, which is why he goes on to say, stop storing up treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy. Now, why does he use that? Well, within the culture right? Wealth was displayed in what you wore. The primary fabric of the day was wool. And if you were wealthy, sometimes you would put uh, strands of gold even within your clothing to, to display that you had wealth. Well, as you know, moth, moths love to eat wool. And he's saying, look at even the display of your own wealth is subject to decay. You can lose it. It can be taken away. When he says the term rust, it's best translated as just simply eating. In other words, every time that this word is used in the New Testament, it's translated as eating. So why would, what does he mean by that? Well, in the first century, one of the primary means in which you had wealth or the wealth of the day was in your grain. So in other words, Jesus is saying all your grain that you stockpile and all the wealth that you have can be eaten by either people or animals. It reminds me of the parable of the rich fool. Luke chapter 12. Listen to this. Luke chapter 12. This is the parable of the rich fool. It begins in verse 16. This is Jesus again, and he says, He told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20 says, But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man 
who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. What's Jesus' point there? He says it's utterly foolish to think that if that your wealth that you can accumulate here and now will last. You never know when your life is going to be over. You never know when you're going to die. So why do you value that which you can lose? Rather value that which you cannot lose. But rather, what does he say? <clears throat> Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why? Because only the treasures in heaven can last. Only the treasures of heaven are eternal. Only the treasures of heaven will endure through the ages. Why? It's because of who dwells in heaven. In other words, that which is of God will last. He who dwells in heaven is God, and your treasures that are with Him and in Him will last because He is eternal. Right? Again, just like the previous phrase, ongoing, repeated action, present tense, He is not just saying do it once when you place, first place your faith in Jesus. He's saying do this as your lifestyle. Have this as the direction of your life. Begin, because they were storing up treasures on the earth, stop doing that, and now begin to what? Store up treasures in heaven. Start treasuring the treasures in heaven. Why? Because they are inherently more valuable. They are lasting. They cannot be taken away. Listen to this. I mean, this is what the Scripture says. The Scripture says this about the treasures in heaven. They consist of a life that will never end. John 3. Right? They consist of a gift that can never be lost. They consist of an unbreakable chain of redemption in Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 29 treasures in heaven consist of a hand out of which no one can take you out of meaning the father's hand a love from which you will never be separated a joy and satisfaction that overrides circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 1. They consist of a foundation that can never be destroyed, a calling that can never be revoked, a new heaven and earth when Jesus comes back where there is no more suffering, there is no more sin where Jesus will live among us. You see, and that's just a taste of what the treasures of heaven are. And Jesus is saying, stop valuing that which can be taken away at the expense of what is more inherently valuable and everlasting. The treasures in heaven. And it should be who you are. For where your treasure is, he goes on to say, there your heart will be also. The inclination or the direction of our hearts reveal who we are. They reveal our character. By the way, the yous in this section where you see in verse um, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So far, he's been using like the, the group, like you all, like they say in Texas, y'all, right? But in verse 21, he laser focuses and gets personal, and it's singular. And he says, you you, you, you. He's not just talking to the group. He's talking to the individual at this point. In other words, who you are is revealed personally, is revealed by who you treasure, what you value most. Think about it. What makes you tick? What do you live for? What could you not live without? How would you finish this phrase? For me to live is... We know the, the verse. It should be Christ. But is that true of us? Or is it wealth? Is it power? Is it substances? Is it sex? Is it toys? Is it fun? Is it position? Is it a stress-free, problem-free life? Is it health? Or is it, as we know it should be, is it Christ? You know what the real issue is here? I'll tell you what it's not first. It's not that Jesus is saying that 
things that are temporary, possessions, riches, wealth, and the things that we enjoy now are inherently sinful. He's not saying they're all bad. That's not what he's saying. In fact, all good things have been given to us by God for us to enjoy. Right? Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. James chapter 1, verse 17. Everything that God gives us is a gift and we should enjoy it. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says this, Instruct those who are rich in this present age to give away all their money because riches is evil. It doesn't say that. It says, who are rich in this present age, not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. In other words, instruct the rich that it's not all about being rich. It's been given to them. They can enjoy it. In fact, later on, he says if they have it, they need to share it. But your hope is on God. Here's the real issue. Jesus is condemning the heart that loves the gifts of God more than it loves God. That's what he's talking about. He's condemning a heart that is more focused and more satisfied in what God gives us rather than in God himself. That's what he's getting at here. And the reason we should value the treasures of heaven is because we value the one who lives in heaven. That is God. We store up treasures there because that's where our heart is. And if our heart is in heaven, it means that we have a heart for the living God. And he is the most valuable person to us. Above all else, we desire God. Why? Because he is vastly more worthy, vastly more satisfying, more desirable than anyone or anything in the universe. That's why he is our treasure. So we ask ourselves, I ask you, what do you treasure? Where, are, where do your affections lie? Can you, can you honestly say with, with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Why? Because when I die, I get to go be with Christ. And it doesn't matter what is taken away from me because Jesus is my treasure. What do we value the most? If God took everything away, would you still trust Him? Would you still value Him? Or is God taking everything away at the present time? Are you despairing? Jesus is saying, repent. Value Jesus. Value Him. Why? Because He is more precious. He's more worthy. He's more satisfying. He is more worth it than everything else. How do we do this? How do we, how do we value Jesus? How do we express that? You know, how do we value the treasures of heaven because we value the one who lives in heaven? What does that look like? How does that practically play out in our life? Well, I, I think a good place to start is to ask ourselves to, or to remind ourselves, what does God value most? Let's start there. And this is one place in the scripture where we can answer that question. Matthew chapter 22. You shall love the Lord your God with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, meaning the totality of your existence. Love God with everything who you are. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, what God values most is His glory in people. So when we talk about where our treasure is, and if it's in the living God, then we will value what God values. And if God values His glory in people, that's what we would value. That's what we live for. We obey Him, why? Because we value Him. We follow Him because we trust Him. Right? We value people. We go out of our way for people. We sacrifice for people. We forgive people. Why? Because they are our neighbor. And God values people who are created in His image. And we value people over possessions, over power, over comfort, over health. Treasure what God does is where we start with that. Value what He values. 
and it demonstrates that that is where our treasure is. Right? The inclination of the heart is to value the temporary. And Jesus says, no, value that which is eternal. Now, the reason it's so important to understand that that's where our heart is drawn towards, the temporary, is found in Jesus' illustration that we read earlier, where in it he reveals the second truth, which is the influence of the heart. Understand where your heart is naturally inclined to, and you need to understand the influence of your heart. And we see this when he gets into verse 22 and 23, where he gives us this illustration that reveals more truth about the heart. He says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. Now, in this illustration, and I'll show you, the eye represents the heart, that would, who we are on the inside. Now, how can we say that? Well, I'll go back to verses 19 through 21. It's clear that Jesus' commands that we just went through, that they were meant to unveil or reveal the natural affections and inclinations of the heart, right? Later on, he's going to talk about serving two masters, that you will either despise the one and love the other. Again, getting into the heart. And in these verses, he contrasts an eye that is clear and an eye that is what? That is bad or unclear, and we'll get into that. So the eye in this illustration is who we are on the inside. So what does that mean? The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Jesus says, the eye, or the heart, is who you really are. The eye is the lamp of the body. The heart is the eye of the soul. Who you are on the inside is who you really are. So who you are on the inside will affect who you are on the outside. Who you are in the totality of your being. It's through the eye or through the heart whether you either accept or reject the truth of who God is and what He's done on your behalf. If the word, if the eye is clear, you know what that word means? Single-minded. That's what that means. If the heart is single-minded, singly or focused on, some, on just one thing, not many things, but one thing. Devoted to one thing. The heart that is fully devoted to the light, that is to God, that is to Jesus. It's clear. It's good. And it demonstrates that you treasure God. Right? The heart, the inside of who we are, is how we perceive everything in life. It's how we perceive who God is. If it's full of light... If it submits to the truth, it affects everything of who we are. In other words, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. It doesn't matter how you behave on the outside. It doesn't matter about so much what you do if the heart isn't in the right place. God's not just looking for outward obedience. God isn't just looking for you to look great on Sunday. God is looking for us to obey Him from the heart every day of our life. Now, we understand not perfectly. Why? Because only Jesus could do that. He did that for us. But that's the direction of our lives. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Literally here, that word bad, it means evil. In fact, when you get down to it, it's, it is by nature evil. A bad heart is an evil heart. And it will affect and influence everything that you are your whole body. It will be full of darkness. You will be blind to the light. You won't care about the light. You'll be insensitive to the light. You will not treasure He who lives in heaven because you are not singly devoted to Him. And it will prevent the light from coming through. An eye that is bad is a heart that is self-focused, self-indulgent. A heart that serves itself, not the living God. It is spiritually blind, and it has no way of recognizing the true light. That's why he says, if the light that is in you is darkness, what does he say? How great is that darkness? 
How great is that darkness? Again, Jesus changes in this verse, in verse 23 and 22, from the group, and he gets focused on the individual. He starts saying you as individuals. He's focusing. It's like it's not what you do. It's why you do it. And if your heart is evil, even though you look good on the outside, it doesn't matter. If you don't address the issue of the heart, you can't sacrifice enough, give enough, serve enough where God will be pleased if you don't address the heart. Joel 2.13 Rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God. Why? Because He's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. See what that verse is getting at? Don't just show God or try to serve God on the outside. Address the inside. You can't appease Him. You can't satisfy Him by just looking good on the outside is what He's saying. Even our righteous deeds, the Scriptures say, if our heart is in the wrong place or what? They're like filthy rags. Soiled menstrual rags. That's what that verse means. Isaiah 64, 6. Now, if that's the influence of our heart on the inside, we need to stop and think about, okay, what are the implications of that? If, that in, if our heart of who we are on the inside affects everything of who we are, what are we going to do about that? Now, maybe we need to be reminded. Maybe we need to do something for the first time. Either way, we need to ask ourselves, where is our heart? Who is our treasure? Who do we value? Can we change our heart that is evil and can we have a heart that is full of light singly devoted to the living God whom we treasure you can but only when you submit to Jesus as your master and confess him as your savior and turn from your sin you know the fact that the influence of the heart is this complete and total should teach us this as well that we need to be careful to guard our hearts and what we allow to influence them. We need to be careful. Why? Because when people walk off the path and, and walk away in sin, it doesn't happen drastically overnight. It happens with little steps as we give our affections over to things that are ungodly and dishonoring of the Lord. And pretty soon... We're drifting. It's what you put in will affect what comes out. Here's the good news. I mean, if you know him today, you have the Spirit of God who lives in you who will guide and empower you to address these issues. Perhaps this morning you just need to be reminded, you know, I've, I've lost focus, I've forgotten who my treasure is, I've gotten so en engrossed in my circumstances and what I need and, and my health or my family, and I have forgotten that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, is my treasure, I value Him more than anything, and no one can take Him away from me. Perhaps that's what we need to hear today. Or perhaps you have never done that, and perhaps you need to realize that I, I haven't given in my whole heart. I'm not singly devoted. I have two loves in this world, and it's myself and God, and Jesus is saying, I can't do that. Today may be the day of repentance for you, the day where you come to know the living God through His Son. Here's the, the good news. If you hear what He says and submit to what He says, and confess Him as He commands. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll give you a new heart. And that which He gives will never be taken away. So that's the second basic truth. The third and final one is, is this. And we'll spend the rest of our time here. The inability of the heart. So He talked about the inclination, the influence, and now he's going to talk about the inability of the heart, something the heart cannot do, and it's found in verse 24. He says this, no one can serve two masters. Now you can read every translation of the Bible there is. You can know what it, how it says that in the original language, and the conclusion you're going to come to is that no one means simply what? No one. This is a statement of totality. 
This is absolute truth from Him who is the truth. And He says, no one can serve two masters. There's no ambiguity here. He's crystal clear. No possibility of serving two masters. The word for master here is the one we usually see that's translated as Lord, the one whom we follow, the one who owns us, the one whom we serve. And the the word for serving here is serve as a slave. In other words, Jesus is saying everyone has a master and everyone serves them as a slave. You might say, oh, I I don't serve anyone. I'm nobody's servant. No one is my master. Consider this. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. There's only two choices, is what he says. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of righteousness. There are those choices. There is no middle ground. This is absolute So if we are deceived to think, well, I don't really serve anybody. The Bible says, no, you do. You either serve God or you serve yourself. And to serve yourself is sin. To serve yourself is temporal. To serve yourself, that can be taken away. But if you serve the living God, it is eternal. It's in heaven. It's reserved. It's precious. It's who and what you value. You cannot do both. You can only have one master. The heart has no ability to have two. It can only have one. It can't be divided in its loyalty. It is impossible. It's very important to to grasp this, brothers and sisters. We can only serve one master. We can't live for ourselves and all the temporal sinful things that this world has to offer and think that, well, I can do that most of the time, but, uh, you know, part of the time, I'm a part-time Jesus follower. Jesus says, no, no, no. I don't accept part-time followers. You're either full-time or you're no-time, is what he says. We cannot claim that he is our supreme Lord and that we owe our allegiance to him and add anything or anyone else to that list, including ourselves, is what he says. When we know that he says this and we can understand what he is saying, and when we resist and don't want to submit to it, we just revealed who we really serve, and it's not him. But when we hear these words, and we drink them in, and we understand them, and and, and we're reminded and we're encouraged... And we're saying, yeah, that's who I serve. I've forgotten, but I remember now. He's my master. I've been so caught up in what I'm going through right now, and I'm so focused on my circumstances, I forgot who I really serve. Jesus is here today reminding you who your master really is. You can't serve two. You'll either be devoted to the one or despise the other. You will be cling to one and be loyal to them and not to the other, is what he says. To despise literally means to look down upon with contempt. And you might say, well, I don't look down on Jesus with contempt. I don't, I just don't follow him sometimes. It's like, you know, we got this arrangement. Like, I have these few things that I like to do, but, you know, I give at the church and I serve and I read my Bible. And, and, hey, I've confessed. I made the prayer. I even got dipped in the water and I'm good to go. And Jesus says, with your divided loyalties, you, your attempt to serve two masters reveals who you really are and you are looking down upon me with contempt. Or put it, let's put it a little bit, maybe a little bit more drastic, a little stronger. You're looking with contempt upon my sacrifice on the cross. And you're saying it has no value. You're saying it doesn't matter. And you're saying it's not worth it. That's what he's saying. You will either love and be devoted to God follow the Lord Jesus or despise Him. You can't do both. We can't, our heart cannot do both. We cannot serve God and wealth. Here is where 
here's where Jesus comes full circle. He said, look it, this is what it's all about. The reason you treasure what's in heaven, the reason why your heart is clear or it's, or it's not clear, it's because who you serve. And here are the two choices, God and wealth. You know what wealth means? It means self. You either serve the living God or you serve yourself. And if it's God, your treasure is in heaven. It can never be taken away. It is far more valuable. If it's yourself, it's temporary. It can decay. And you could lose it at any moment. Which is why Jesus said in that parable, you fool, why is your life all about stuff when your soul is required of you tonight? The one commands us to walk by faith. The other one commands us to walk by sight. The one calls us to be humble. The other one calls us to be proud. The one calls us to set our minds on the things above and the other one, the things of the earth. The one calls us to love the light. The other one calls us to love the darkness. There are two masters. There can only be two masters. And we have the choice. Who are we going to serve? You know, that's why John, the apostle, the beloved, whom Jesus loved, that's why he said this, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Why? Because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Listen to this. Listen to this temporary nature of this age. Of the, the world is passing away also with its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Can you see the words of Jesus in that? in those words. If you are devoted to and live for everything in the here and now, the temporal pleasures that I can enjoy, and he goes on to define them, the lust of the, the things that your body craves, or that which you see, or the pride of life, is that, if that's what you live for, you love the world, and you don't love God. You serve yourself, you don't serve the Master, is what John is saying. It's, it's self-deception to think that we can have two. We're deceiving ourselves. We can't be neutral. We can't serve our own selfish appetites most of the time and then try to serve God part-time. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. It's who we are. I mean, think of Jesus says, where's your treasure? Is it there or is it here? Where is your treasure? What do you value? What are you living for? And by the way, do you want to know a little bit more about that? It's all about who you are on the inside, not about who you are on the outside. And if you're right with me on the inside, if I am your treasure, your whole life will be full of light. If, it, if I'm not your treasure, then it will be full of darkness. How great is that darkness? You are in a desperate state. You can't serve two masters. And you either serve yourself, your flesh, your sinful appetites, or your master, you are its slave, or you serve righteousness, the living God, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is your master, and you are His servant. It's the only two choices. You can't do both. You can know much, you, you know, if you, you can't walk in both directions at the same time. Think of it that way. The world, Christ. You can't physically do that. When we think about it, when we, and I said this earlier, when, when we think about divided loyalties that linger still in our heart, issues that we haven't submitted to the Lordship of Christ, if we allow those to remain and not address them, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Right? Your flesh will step by step pull you away. Pull you away. Now, if you're truly God's and you have repented and you are truly His child, guess what? He'll, he'll go after you and He'll bring you back. And you know who determines how difficult that is? You do. Because the, more, the longer you walk away, the harder your heart becomes and the harder the hammer's got to strike to break you. Don't allow divided loyalties 
Don't try to serve two masters. It's impossible. You can't do it. And here's the thing, though. Sometimes we think we can. We're like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, I hear you. You're right, I need to deal with that. But then in, our, in the back of our mind, we're thinking like, I can do it. I can do it. I, I, I can handle it. I'm okay. That's true of everybody else, but you know, I can, I can do that. There's just one issue I, I don't have to deal with. It's okay. You know, but you know, I'm like 90% there, man. It's okay. God understands. He and I have an agreement. Well, Jesus say, no, no, we don't have any agreement, and you can't do it, and it will affect you. And if you're demonstrating to yourself you, that you have a divided loyalty, that you only give me most of yourself, Jesus saying, you haven't given me anything. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a struggle, right? Because we know there's a struggle. But what's the direction? Here's... I think the best part of this passage. Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And if our treasure is Christ, the Son of the living God, it can't be taken away. He cannot be taken away. All that He has accomplished, all that He promises, all that He has given, all that He will give, all that He promises He will do, cannot be taken away. He knows all that you're going through. He knows all of your needs. And He will never forsake you when you treasure Him the most. When He is the person you value, the person you live for. It can never be taken away. Never. Why? Because it's in heaven with Him who dwells in heaven. If Jesus is our treasure, then we will live our life like he is the most important person to us. That's how we tell if he's our treasure. If he's not the most important person to us, he's not our treasure. And it'll show itself in the way we live. It's that simple. As the band comes forward and as we get ready to focus on this one, this master, the one who is our treasure, I want to draw your attention to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's chapter 7. Remember, the whole sermon is about the heart, addressing the issues of the heart. He says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, all, all that I have said about the heart, all I've said about repentance, all I've said about forsaking outward obedience without addressing the heart, everything that I've said, whoever hears these words of mine and acts on them, in other words, the one who repents, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. He's the rock in the illustration. If you hear what I've said, if you've repented, if I am your treasure, if you value me, if you address the heart, it, nothing and no one can touch you because I am your rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, who says, okay, yeah, that's good. Well, maybe I'll do some of it, basically rejects them. Who does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. If Jesus is not your rock, if he's not your foundation, if he's not the one you trust in, if he's not the one you hope for, if he's not the one you treasure, if he's not the one you obey, your foundation is sand. And what happens to sand when it rains? It crumbles. As we focus on the cross this morning, we are reminded That what? It is finished. The debt 
has been canceled. We are now alive. We are now children of the living God. We have the hope of heaven. We have the joy of the Holy Spirit. And it cannot be taken away. So brothers and sisters, as we thank Jesus this morning, as we remember Him around His table, let us remember that He is our treasure. Father, as we've taken these few moments to just be reminded or maybe challenged on where our heart really is. I know there's those among us who, Lord, we love you. We, we treasure you. Our heart is focused on you. And what a joy it is to know that that can never be taken away. We don't confess that we're perfect. We know we're not. But more than anything, we love Jesus, and He is the most valuable person to us. May we remember that this morning. If we're not there, God, I pray you'd use your word by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring those who have not submitted all of who they are to the Lordship of Jesus and save them today. Be honored, we ask. Amen.